I hear them all the time now. The train bells, ringing loudly in my ears, persistently clanging, clanging, clanging. I've tried to get rid of them. Earphones, blasting my car stereo. Nothing, not a goddamn thing can stop that damn ringing. It keeps me awake at night. Not like I could sleep much anyway. All I know is that my life now is motel after motel, grimy sinks and sticky carpets. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is that he doesn't find me. It started three weeks ago. I was leaving my dad's terrible, devoid, rural town after visiting for a few days. He was a drunk. Not a mean one, but a neglectful one. Now that me and my siblings were out of the house, it didn't matter so much that he couldn't take care of anything, let alone himself. But my brother and I still visit every once in a while to check up on him, do the dishes, that sort of thing. Our sister refused to see him. Anyway, my dad's town has one road that serves as the entrance and exit. There's a rusted sign bearing the town's name that marks where the town ends and begins. Next to the sign is a railroad track. It was around dusk, and I was sitting in my idling car at the crossing, the yellow traffic light off to the left flashing, indicating the oncoming train. I could hear the bells clanging in the distance. I drew my fingers on my steering wheel, humming out the tune to a song I barely remembered and waiting for the train to come. I noticed movement in my periphery and looked to my left, where I saw a man. He was standing very still, so still it was almost statuesque. I squinted a little harder at him, but in the dim light, all I could make out was a dirty wife beater and shoulder length, greasy black hair. He started swaying. It looked like he was dancing, but he didn't have a partner. His arms were raised in the air, as if to be on someone's shoulders, and he waltzed around the edge of the track to the tune of the ringing bells. I thought this was a little odd, but as I said before, my dad lives in a small town and druggies were a dime a dozen. I routinely saw unusual behaviour on my visits there. Still, I rolled up my windows and locked my doors just to be safe. I sighed heavily and stared in the opposite direction of the man in search of the train. It seemed to be taking an awfully long time for this damn thing to pass by. I glanced at the man again who had now moved to the crossing in front of my car. He continued his waltz, feet deftly stepping over the metal of the track beneath him. What the hell is he doing? I said aloud, my hand firmly pressed against the horn of my wheel. The man stopped, his back turned to me. I stopped honking my horn. Several seconds passed, and finally, the man turned around, hips rotating before feet, and my stomach dropped at the face of the thing in my headlights. His face was marred, cuts occupying so much skin that he was made mostly of scar tissue than actual skin. He had sores on his cheeks and forehead, oozing pus and blood, and his smile that rotten grin will haunt every waking thought I have. He continued to stand there, grinning that blackened grin, and I prayed that the train would come so soon so I could leave the man and that awful town behind. The bells were still sounding, but I could finally hear the horn in the distance. Finally, I muttered to myself, my eyes glued to the thing in front of me. He raised a hand and waved, 
slowly, wiggling each finger individually. I could feel the pace of my heart quicken. And then, suddenly, he took off at a dead sprint and launched himself under the hood of my car. He thudded heavily on the metal. I jerked back in my seat and laid on my horn to let him know to get off my damn car, even though I knew it wouldn't work. He somehow stretched his lips across his teeth a little wider and started pounding on my windshield with his fists. Once, twice, over and over and over. The train was getting closer now. I could see it, and fissures began to crack the glass. I'll admit, I was scared. Who wouldn't be? He hit my windshield furiously, like he was desperate to get to me. I didn't want to know what he'd do once he got through the glass. The train was almost here, so I did the only thing I could think of and put the gear shift in reverse. I backed up a few dozen feet. The man was still banging on my windshield, howling like an animal, little pants escaping in between his grunts. The train was nearly in front of me. I floored the gas. The man held onto my car, his smile as wide as ever, but with a terrible anger in his eyes. I neared the tracks. The bells were ringing. I took my foot off the gas and slammed the brakes just a couple feet in front of the train, and the man flew off the hood of my car. His body propelled into the oncoming train, but I didn't watch to see where he landed or if his body broke into smaller pieces. I slammed my hands on my steering wheel as the train took its time to pass, and I stomped on the gas pedal once more when it had finally gone. I probably should have stayed to tell the police what happened, but I didn't. I went home. I parked my car in the garage. I cleaned the blood from my grill, and the next day... I took my car in to get the windshield replaced. I did my best to forget about it. I ignored the fear every time I got into my car. I drank myself to sleep so that I wouldn't dream. But I couldn't forget. And I didn't need to be asleep to see him again. I didn't drink one night, I guess. I dreamed of the man, howling laughing, breaking through the glass of my car and hammering my body with his fists, his excited drool dripping onto my face, his oozing sores leaking into my mouth. I woke up in a cold sweat, and there he was, manifested at the foot of my bed. I hoped I was still asleep. I had to be, right? I slapped myself several times, but this wasn't a dream. I was awake. The man was dancing that same dance, whirling around my bedroom, the sound of the bells in my ears, and then he stopped. Hands suspended in the air, his black grin widened and he turned to stare at me, excitement in his eyes this time. I froze. I couldn't get myself to move. My fear was palpable, stealing any governance I had of my own body. I didn't understand how the man could be here. He was dead, wasn't he? We stared at each other, a stalemate. The air was still. The only sound in the room was the clanging in my ears. And then, the man launched himself at me. He shoved me down and pummeled my chest, thrashing his fists against my ribcage. I felt a crack under my skin, and I gasped from the pain as he continued his assault. I remembered that I kept a bat by my nightstand, so I grabbed it and hit him over the head with it. He fell to the other side of my bed, 
and I stumbled to my feet, my chest feeling like fire and my lungs struggling to keep up with me. The man slid across my bed, slowly, and stood in front of me, body poised to pounce again. Then, the left side of his body lit up with light, as if a car's headlights were trained on him. The bells were ringing, the horn was blaring, and the man turned to look when his body was thrust into my wall. He landed with a wet thump on the floor. His body twisted so that I could see his face, even though his back was to me. My heart thudded painfully in my battered chest. What the hell had hit him? I stared at the body on my floor in horror and watched as it melted and disappeared. I left that night, packed a bag and tossed it in my trunk. I haven't been home since. I stayed in my car the first night at a truck stop. It's been motels ever since then. Never the same one for more than one night. I don't want to give him the chance to find me again. To finish what he started in my bedroom. But it doesn't matter where I am or what I'm doing. I always hear the sound of those goddamn bells.